Skyrim's sun is magnificent. It's also the father of one of the most inconsistent damage types in the game, sun damage. In this video, I'll go over my journey of beating the game using the power of the sun, and the many bugs and mechanics I used along the way. But first things first, I needed to take care of my fashion. The Divine Crusader creation adds the perfect armor for this run, so I just had to buy it. You find the armor on some bandits, and since I had no source of damage, I trained my pickpocket skill to 100 to get the perfect touch perk. I used that to reclaim the armor from the bandits. The enchantments are a bit underwhelming, but I would fix that later. Alright, now we can formally begin. The first thing I needed was the Sunfire spell. The spell tome is guaranteed to spawn on a bookshelf in Fort Dongard, but it doesn't appear there until later in the quest line. That doesn't mean it isn't in the cell, however. Using the free camera reveals that the spell tome is directly under the floor, with the Dongard's merchant chests nearby. If I could reach those, I could have all three sun spells from the beginning. For that, I would need two things. One edged, one round. The round one, a bucket, needed to clip through the wall. The edged, a do not delete, to stand on while out of bounds. The easiest way to get a do not delete is to crouch in front of the counter in the drunken huntsman and pick it up through the seam in the ground. The clip was simple. And once I was out of bounds, I dropped the do not delete below me to break my fall. I juggled it beneath me until I was within range. Then I picked up the book and opened Florentius' chest to obtain the other two spells. At this point I would mostly be relying on Sunfire, but the other two spells would come in handy. Speaking of Florentius, I was going to have to rescue him to secure my next item of interest the Dawnguard Rune Axe. But to get Florentius, I had to progress until the Prophet quest with the Dawnguard. Vampires inside Dim Hollow Crypt didn't pose much of a challenge. I whittled the tougher ones down using Sunfire, since it has very high damage for its Magicka usage. This was exaggerated by the Necromage perk, which made my spells 25% more powerful against undead. Lokiel and his friends were a different story, though. His damage was too much for me to outlast, and what's more, he has a Thrall bodyguard that I couldn't even deal damage to. It seemed like I was out of options, until I got this message. Well, if you can't beat him, join him. Since I had the Necromage perk, becoming a vampire meant that my self-cast spells would last 50% longer. So I used this to combine invisibility with Stendar's aura. This gave me enough time and invisibility to kill Lokiel without breaking stealth. But this wouldn't be enough on its own. To deal more damage, I held the spell in dual cast while the cloak was active. Because I had the restoration dual casting perk, my cloak did 120% extra damage. As for the thrall, I still had no way to damage them. But I could trap them so they wouldn't fight Serana after which I dropped her off at Castle Volkehar. Next, I recruited Serene and Gunmar, but Isron wasn't too thrilled that I had turned. I was also starting to realize that not being able to regenerate in the sun was pretty out of character, so I went to Falion and Morthal to get cured and rejoin the Dawnguard. To find Florentius, I would have to go to Runevald. I used Invisibility and Muffle to walk to the end, but I couldn't talk to Florentius because he was hostile to his captors. So I cast Calm on him to talk to him through the cage, and this was enough to complete the quest. With Florentius at Fort Dongard, I was all set to do the Lost Relic quests. Now, the side quest you receive is random, but you can re-roll which one you get by reloading to before you turned in the last quest. Doing this, I was able to get the Dongard Rune Hammer, which is useless to me since it deals fire damage and getting the other two was going to be a bit more difficult. Most of the side quests involve fetching an item or killing a vampire leader, but a few of them require you to kill vampires that have blended into society. Easy enough, or it would be if they were actually vampires. Due to an oversight, these disguised vampires don't have the vampire race, meaning sun damage has no effect on them. Why not just reset to skip those quests? Well, the Dawnguard side quests are given to you in sets, 
So to get the other two artifacts, I would have to complete both A Jarl's Justice and Hide and Seek. Since the game cheated me, I decided to stretch the rules and use a certain other Sun-related artifact. That's right, I'm of course talking about the Staff of Magnus. You see, Magnus is considered to be the god of the sun, and according to Tamrielic Artifacts Part 3, Magnus' staff served him as a metaphysical battery. So you could say that the Staff of Magnus literally uses the power of the sun. You might think that I would have to play through the entire college quest line to get the staff, but you can just ride up to the back entrance to get into the Labyrinthian. You do have to clip through a few doors though. Instead of using an object clip, I opted to use another method called jelly clipping. To do this, I used an offhand attack to move my model through the door, then ate a netch jelly to paralyze myself. After getting back up, I was on the other side. Morake decided not to attack me, which made obtaining the staff a breeze. So now I should be able to use the staff to kill the vampires, right? Well, it's not so simple. The Staff of Magnus is supposed to absorb health once the target runs out of magicka. But in reality, it won't switch to absorb health, even if the opponent is at zero magicka. But I discovered that the Staff is perfectly capable of dealing damage. For the Staff does not check the opponent's magicka reserves, but the player's. With this knowledge, I used a potion to disable my magicka regeneration, and cast spells until my magicka reached zero. This enabled the staff's absorb health effect, the strength of which was boosted by fortify restoration potions. Now that I could complete the side quests, I was able to obtain the other two rune artifacts. The Dawnguard Rune Shield casts Stendar's Aura on you while you're blocking, at the cost of 15 stamina per second. Using this doesn't break invisibility, and it only requires one vegetable soup to keep it up. Unfortunately, you can't do the dual cast glitch with the shield equipped, so its usefulness is somewhat limited. And now for the real prize, the Rune Axe. Its enchantment deals 10 sun damage for every 10 undead killed since the last sunrise, up to a maximum of 100 damage. And since the enchantment doesn't need to be recharged, it was an invaluable addition to my arsenal. Now, it would be irrational to kill 100 undead every day to keep it at peak effectiveness. But for some reason, the script that resets the counter breaks if you smith the axe. This means I would only have to kill 100 undead total to maintain max damage. First though, I had to get rid of that pesky physical damage. Lucky for me, the rock joint disease reduces damage with melee weapons. Granted, it's only a 25% reduction, but it's considered a restoration effect by the game. So, if you use a fortify restoration potion before becoming infected, you get a total of... 25% damage reduction. Yeah, it turns out that this version of the disease doesn't scale with restoration buffs. However, there's another version of Rock Joint that you can contract from traps, and that one is affected by Fortify Restoration. Since they're not mutually exclusive, I only needed a potion of at least 200% strength to reach negative 100% melee damage. Instead of killing 100 separate undead, I decided to kill the same low-level Draugr over and over. I could achieve this using Scrolls of Ray's Zombie. Unlike the spell, the scroll doesn't disintegrate the target when the effect ends. But there was a problem. Since I removed the physical damage from the axe, I couldn't kill the Draugr with it and thus couldn't increase the kill count. But it turns out that as long as the target dies within 2 seconds of hitting them, the counter will increase. So I finished the Draugr with Vampire's Bane until I reached 10 kills. After that, it was just a long grind to 100. This was made a little easier using a technique called wiggling. By holding a weapon in the offhand and spamming the directional keys while attacking, the weapon will throw out multiple attacks at once.
Before finishing the game, there was one more source of sun damage that I had to collect. Oriel's Bow. The bow is unique since its sun damage affects living targets as well as undead. It's a bit inconvenient to collect though, being near the end of the Dawnguard questline. But what if I told you that you could obtain the bow and complete Dawnguard without even beginning the first quest? Dawnguard has a massive sequence break that leads right to the end. To begin, I entered Darkfall Cave and clipped through the east wall near the entrance. Landing in the water near the shrine, I flicked the hidden lever to the left. This caused the way shrine to raise out of the ground. Once the animation finished, I used the lever again to activate the portal, and headed on through to Darkfall Passage. Next I had to perform a more difficult clip on the south wall so my follower wouldn't get stuck fighting. Darkfall Passage is actually a world space, meaning it has a walkable floor outside the interior portion. This definitely put my mountain climbing skills to the test, and I had to make sure not to hit the edge. Normally in a world space, if you go beneath the ground, the game will warp you back up to the top. But if you're over the void, the game can't find any valid land to place you on, and it freezes. Eventually, though, I made my way up to some flat ground and ran north to the second way shrine. This way shrine also has a lever out of bounds, but because of the world space warping I mentioned earlier, it's all but impossible to activate it through normal means. This is where the follower comes in. If you command your follower to activate the lever through the ground, they can't get close enough. But, if you press the menu button to cancel the command right before letting go of the activation key, you will temporarily maintain the reach of the follower command mode and use the faraway object yourself. This is called remote interaction, and I used it to raise the way shrine and enter the forgotten veil. I immediately started heading up the cliff above the frozen lake, so I could enter Ariel's chapel from the outside. When it became too steep to climb, I bust out the do not delete and began my slow ascent to the balcony. This is actually the ice wall that Verther normally sits behind. To scale it, I used a bug called Jelly Hovering. If you activate a chair, paralyze yourself with Netch Jelly while putting away your weapon, then save and reload while you're getting up, you'll enter a ragdoll state where you can slightly influence your movement by jumping. I spent about 5 minutes floating over the top. Once I was on the other side, I ate another jelly to return to normal. You may have noticed that Verther is missing. I couldn't start the boss fight without him, but all I had to do was enter the inner sanctum and come back. This enabled Verther, and also brought Serana for the balcony cutscene. Now I was stuck behind the ice wall though. Since there were no other chairs for me to sit in, I just used a large bucket like a normal person. Even though Verther was dead, Gelibor didn't come through the portal, so I had to go back to Darkfall to talk to him and return for my prize. Unlike with melee weapons, there's no disease that decreases bow damage, but the bow does unlock the power of the Sun Hallowed Arrows, which create a sun blast when hitting a surface. The blast deals 15 damage, or more accurately, 5 plus 10 damage. This explosion is further unique in that it comes from an arrow. As a consequence, the 5 base damage actually scales with archery buffs, perks, and skill level. So by buffing some fortify archery gear with restoration potions, and a fortify marksman potion on the side, I could use the bow to great effect by shooting at the feet of my enemies. The damage is also affected by Berserker Rage, and combining that with the double shot bug, I killed Harkin with only three arrows. But when it came to fight Mirmalnir, I realized that the explosions dealt no damage to dragons. This gave me an opportunity to use the Sun Hollowed Arrow's signature ability, 
the Sunburst attack. It lasts 15 seconds with each Skybolt dealing 15 damage. But if you slow down time, the Skybolts will come out at the same rate, even though the duration increases. Using the Steady Hand perk, which actually slows down time by 75%, I effectively quadrupled the potential damage per arrow. While the Alduin fight at the Throat of the World was essentially the same as with Miramir, the final battle wouldn't be as straightforward. Oriel's bow has an exception for Sovngarde that prevents you from using the Sunburst. So that left me with the Staff of Magnus once again. But this time, things would be different. Aside from the fact that I had much more powerful restoration potions than before, I also used the Rune Axe to apply a couple weakness to magic poisons. So, that's how I beat Skyrim with the power of the sun. Special thanks to everyone who discovered bugs that were used in this video. Links to them are in the description. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.